Well, it's a real pleasure to uh, have our speaker here today, Dr. Um, Leitenberg. I hope that's close enough that uh, he won't feel insulted. We were very fortunate in getting him to share with us a lot of experience he's had in trying to provide energy in places uh, that, don't, that don't, aren't able to burn coal and all those other things that we need to light our, I'm sorry, no, <laughs> to replace all that, of course. But, but in places where, where uh, that ele normal electricity isn't available and a much more efficient way to produce power. And uh, I'll let him fill in anything he wants to on that and, and welcome him. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you very much, Roger. <laughs> uh, Thank you for the, uh, for the honor to be a speaker for your uh, club today. And uh, listening to your vision and your mission, solar cooking and these projects fit right into it. So hopefully you will be part of that too at some of these, these days. Actually, my name is Ellen Lichtenberg. And actually, if I translate it, it's a Dutch name. It means light on the mountain. So maybe that's why I do these sort of projects in, in Nepal and other countries. Let's first look at some of the different cookers we have and we use at home. This is the one we use regularly for the last 26 years now, okay? It's called the box cooker. It is a, a box inside another box uh, made out of cardboard and uh, aluminum foil on the inside to reflect the heat and the moisture back. And the insulation is very high tech. It is crumpled up newspaper, all right? And so glass on top, and I can set it to different angles to the sun, depending on where the sun is. And I can put in four pots, and in three hours, four hours, your food is done, you don't have to be there. You don't need to stir, lasagna and so forth, you do not need to uh, pre-do these strips and so forth, okay? So this is the one we use uh, very frequently for the last 26 years. Now this is a little bit heavy to, to bring to Nepal in these mountains, right? So I came up with this design, it's uh, um, you can use it as a head, I guess, but it is really a solar cooker. Uh, this rolls up into a little cylinder. Okay, you point it to the sun, and then uh, either a beer can, Coca-Cola can, or I have these baked on in Nepal a little bit. This is my pot. So in 20 minutes, I have soup or pasteurized water, and in 35 minutes, I have brown rice cooked. Okay, because around this thing is a light fixture to keep the heat in there. I put it here in the focal point, and like I say, in 35 minutes, I have my, my uh, um, rice done. And then the spoon goes around, people hold up their hands, feel it, taste it, and then the aha moment comes up, and then they understand that it works. And then I have pictures, like I have there on the table there, of cookers where they can go to, to either get them, or better yet, how to make them. Okay, another solar cooker which also works very well is the Cook It, developed originally by Solar Cookers International in Sacramento, 51C3. I'm a volunteer for them. This folds up in a package like this. And actually, also, I teach uh, kids, you know, fourth graders, high school kids, adults, everybody to, to make the same thing. So, what is this? This is a Basically, it's a, you can fold this up, this is a reflective, you know, aluminum foil or cardboard. Uh, the, the pot is your food, and in two, two hours or so, your food is cooked. You don't have to stir again, and uh, it's, uh, you have the plastic roasting oven back around it to keep the heat in. So uh, this is solar, or, uh, and you don't need to, to stir. Uh, let me see, and then I have some other gadgets here. A little solar, solar lighting, which we use in the in the villages, and this is made in Nepal with LED lights, and we'll be talking about uh, biomass briquetting as well. So that's in a nutshell <coughs> about solar cookers. However, the, this is the Cadillac of solar cookers, if you will. Okay, it is a like a funnel, right? So if I put a piece of paper in here, it will burn. I can set it to different angles to the sun. You know, um, we, we set this thing up in Everest Base Camp in the year 2000 when everybody wanted to climb. 
and so it's all focusing in there. It's very lightweight. This falls, you know, this is uh, six parts taped apart, and all these these the, these tubes uh, also can be taken apart. So it's only three kilograms, six pounds. Uh, and then also, what you can do, you might be interested. I can make whiskey in this thing. <laughs> I put this in the focal point here, and I can make moonshine with sunshine. All right, so. <laughs> But I'm not promoting this stuff in the, in the developing countries, all right? So anyway, let's, uh, let's go to the, some of the pictures here. Um, so this is me. And uh, OK, this is the view from space to the Earth. Looks beautiful, right? But there's many, many problems in there. Environment and so forth, climate change, and also for the people themselves. You know, we had uh, currently 7.25 billion people on this, on this uh, planet, way too much. And if you look at the lack of safe water, sanitation, uh, no lighting, uh, the poverty and so forth, more than half the, of this planet is in a very uh, bad shape. So we need to do something about it. Okay, so why these projects in Nepal? How in the heck did I go there? Well, I had the chance in 79 for HP, I had to go to India, and then I was so close to Nepal, I just totally fell in love with this country. The people, the, 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 the cultures, um, let's see, the, the mountains and so forth. So I knew I would be back there. So every four, I was still working for money at HP, so I could only go every four years or so. Another big thing happened in my life is meeting these, I call them champions. I'm always looking for champions for these projects. Barbara Kerr and Sherry Cole, you know, they really inspired me to actually make, make the solar cookers and become part of the solar cooker movement. All right? And uh, if you go to Solar Cookers International website, you see these projects all over the world. Any country in the world is something like that. So then I made my first solar cooker. You can see this looks very similar to the one I made in, in my backyard. Okay, the third significant event happened is that, hey, I could retire from HP early if I wanted to, and I was wait waiting for that for some years, and now I could go to Nepal and actually start solar cooking as a program there, because I saw the deterioration and, and landslides in the country every time I visited there. So Nepal is one of the, you know, the, one of the poorest countries in the world. They need really solutions for, and do this in a sustainable way. So you know, we take for granted you know, to have water, health, hunger, energy, environment, and so forth. You know, that all should work here, but not there. And the key is also to empower women and families there, because they quite often do it all. I don't know what these guys are doing, but you know, I'm just joking. But uh, the, the women do it really all in these countries. And then also, um, we have to um, help the disabled people because they, there's stigma associated with them, because they think they, people think they were, uh, have done something wrong in their previous life. Okay, so, so what are these, these, the biggest problem? Well, maybe you cannot see it on the back side, but this is like up to 100 pounds of fuel wood carrying car far away, and then every three days or so, the women again, or the girls, go back and to get that, that fuel wood, and it is for cooking, right? <clears throat> so a big burden, literally. So when I retired early in 1992, I uh, took the plane to Nepal and uh, went to all these different NGOs to see if they were interested to put this into their programs. They all said this is a great program, but they were the big butters, right? So finally I found CRT, the Center of Rural Technologies. They were willing to listen to me and actually to, to start a, a project in the, um, in the villages and this, looked, this went very well and they decided to put this into their programs. So then we also uh, went to the, to the biggest uh, squares in Kathmandu and also other cities and showing all the different devices, cooking uh, different food, let people taste it, smell it and so forth, get television involved, radio, et cetera, et cetera, to make this, this awareness creation. Um, but as I said earlier, you know, my strategy is basically to find champions, find good people who, who feel that this is a good thing to do. And uh, so um, the Center of Rural Technologies, they became one of my first champions out there. Um, then 
another organization, Foundation of Sustainable Technologies, Sanukaji Shrestha, is a dear friend of mine now, and he has done many of the projects I'm doing uh, in Nepal. You know, I'm only in Nepal like two months, three months, but he is there basically all the time. So that was a real help. And another champion, there are many others too, but this is the Basra Foundation by Martin Oldhoff, another fellow from Holland, uh, like me originally. And uh, he, he, I helped him start a uh, kickstart a program in the refugee camps, Bhutanese refugee camps in Nepal, where 110,000 people were kicked out of Bhutan and into these refugee camps, all right? Well, you can see what kind of environmental problem that would be. So I got him started, and then he did a lot of work in, uh, in following this up and doing the whole thing with fundraising, and et cetera, et cetera. So now 100,000 people have access to, to solar cooking. Okay, so that was one problem. The other problem is the open fire cooking. You know, um, this, it is killing smoke. If, if you go into these villages, you're, you can hardly breathe. Your eyes and, and, and lungs and so forth. And also, women and children are in there all, most of the time. And then these are very inefficient stoves. If you can see that one there, less than, well, maybe 20% or so of the heat goes into, the, into these pots. The other problem is too, that you have burn victims. Kids fall into the open fire and they're scarred for life. Their skins are still growing, but nobody in, in Nepal can take care of that sort of thing. And then also, if you get uh, sparks on the set roofs, then you, the, you, your, your house can uh, get in fire and actually whole villages have been wiped out. So the solutions come up every morning, right? It's the sun. And uh, so in Nepal, the actual government is nice enough to give a little bit of subsidy for the parabolic cooker. That one is, is a little bit bigger than this one. This one meter, that is 1.4 meter. And then they also give subsidy on the box cooker, which is not made out of cardboard, but it is made, made up of uh, wood, because cardboard in these countries and the humidity the wouldn't work properly. <clears throat> now, if you want to go high tech, this is a, this is a Scheffler cooker. This is nine square meter, okay? Uh, these are all individual mirrors here. And then the focal point is, is a hole in the kitchen where they have a pot which is sort of this big and it cooks for the students in this, uh, um, in the university here in, in Kathmandu. And uh, it moves with the sun. And I had my little uh, backpack cooker right here uh, next to this giant here. Now we're not done yet. Okay, if you put these things in parallel, you put five on here and five on the other side, and in the middle is this, this uh, pipe, it's a steam pipe, which goes into the kitchen, and again they have the gigantic pots where they cook for 1,500 meals in a very cold Ladakh climate there for the soldiers there. And actually one of these is also uh, in Nepal, in Kathmandu, with the Basra Foundation. And I'm not kidding you. This one, you cannot see it. But this is six times 14, 84 of these things moving with the sun uh, automatically, okay, and 38,000 meals a day. Are you getting hungry already? <laughs> so, of course, this has a lot of other problems uh, with you know, maintenance and so forth. So I, I don't do these things. I, I like the more simple things where people can, uh, you're responsible for, for the, the, the cooker themselves. Okay, what now if there's no sunshine? Okay, well, we need to have a solution for that as well. So this is the rocket stove principle. It is like an elbow here, and the insulation is ash. And um, with three tracks of wood, uh, you can cook for a whole family. Um, hardly any smoke, just at the beginning when you start. And if I put a, uh, a skirt around it, like you can see here, but put a skirt around it on that side there, um, the, the flames go in there a little bit more and it's even more efficient. <clears throat> so these rocket stoves, you, you should be able to see in, in the typical village uh, pattern where they have the, the rocket stove. And then on the bottom right here um, is a heat retaining box. What that means, it is a, a box which is very well insulated. So if I bring my uh, water to boil, then put rice in there, and then put it in this heat retaining box, like a hay box, close it up. One hour later, your rice is done, without any energy to put into it, because the, the heat cannot go anywhere. You do the same thing with the lentils, they eat uh, dalbat, rice and lentils, 
horizon lentils. So this is a great method. We call it the integrated method, if you will. And then, you know, of course, they, they're very good in making baskets and so forth. So this is a heat retaining basket, the same thing. A basket within another basket and wool as the insulation. And again, it is not a pit on your stove, if you will. Okay, big problem all over the world, and Nepal is not different. Fecal material get into the uh, water sources and people get sick, people die from it, and so forth. Now, <coughs> you may not know, but you do not need to boil water, okay, contaminated water with, with viruses or bacteria. If you bring it to pasteurization temperature, it's good enough. Look at this slide here, hepatitis A, is the, the most difficult one to, to kill, and that's at 65 C, 149 Fahrenheit. So the reason people still boil the water is because you see the bubbles going up, and you say, okay, we're done. So what Solar Cookers International had done, they, they came up with a very clever uh, design. We call it the WAPI. This is a WAPI. That means water pasteurization indicator. So this is the high temperature polycarbonate tube which has some wax inside, which melts at nine degrees more uh, than you need, okay? So you hang this in your pot with water, heat it up, hopefully with a solar cooker, but any other way, okay? Gas, electric, whatever. When it goes, when it's down to the bottom, uh, you know, okay, I can stop heating, putting more energy in there. And then you turn this thing upside down and you can reuse it, so reusable, okay? So very clever invention. And uh, we use it, you know, in, when we are camping and also in Nepal, I tell people if I want drinking water, we're going to pasteurize if we are not going to boil it. Now it turns out in, in, in Nepal they don't have polycarbonate, so I asked them to collect uh, see through ballpoint pens. You have to be creative. So the see through ballpoint pens, we cut them up, and I donate this, this, uh, this wax, it's actually powder the first time, and then you know, they cut them up and then put the powder in there, cut it up, and then. Um, drill holes in it, and um, this is their wappies right there. So, uh, very interesting and uh, very useful as well. Now, <clears throat> I've done testing in the field, and I don't need a, a laboratory for that. IDEX company in the US, they donate many of these tubes for me when I go to Nepal, and what it is, you, you can take a sample, and this is for coliform and E. coli bacteria. You take a sample of the water, um, then uh, put it in, on your body in the dark for 24 hours. You have to sleep with it. And then the next day, if it's yellow, it means that it's contaminated, okay? So what I do then too, um, we, uh, we take the contaminated water, pasteurize it in the solar cooker, okay? Pasteurization temperature reached and 10, nine degrees more. Um, then we do the same test. And then 34 hours later, the, it's clear. Okay, so there's an indication that this, this works. <clears throat> no contaminants in there. And then this is a little bit more fancy, but still simple too. This 3M makes these things. It's a little uh, template here. We call it the petrifirm plate. You, you take a little sample, one milliliter sample. You, you put it in between here. You, you, you push it down with a special thing, and then in the dark for 24 hours. And now this thing, you can actually count the number of coliform and the number of uh, E. coli uh, particles. Which one is blue, the other one become, becomes uh, um, a red. So this is an actual, this is, gives you the numbers. <clears throat> so the solution you know, is basically putting contaminated water in your solar cooker or uh, get one of these solar water pasteurizers. And there's different kinds in Nepal now. Um, the best way is to have them with, with dark, you know, the, the pots with, with, or the, the, the bottles uh, with, with, uh, with black surfaces on them. That, that's the fastest way. <clears throat> uh, not only safe water is a problem, but also water in itself. The problem is that even in the monsoon season, where you can see the water rise you know, in the summer months, uh, all that water goes into the rivers, you know, from the, from the streets into the rivers, and it really should be captured, okay? So, <clears throat> 
this is what you see a lot in, in Kathmandu and Patan. I, I live on the other side of Patan when I'm out there. And when I take a shower, I take a very short, and I always have a bucket in front of me, in the back of me, to collect all that water and so forth. So I don't use it much. But OK, anyway, the, the solution of, of uh, this water problem is to um, basically do rainwater harvesting, collect the water from, from the roofs, and then put them in a, in a, in a uh, cisterns or in a, a big containers there. Uh, but then you're not done yet. Because what you also want to do is, is get the, the groundwater up. So by just drilling holes into the ground, you can make, make sure that the, the, uh, the, the, um, uh, the level of the groundwater will, will raise. Because that's, again, a big problem in Kathmandu and, and, and Patan. And you can also make small lakes. And then so that, that's another way to, uh, to get water, to maintain the water in that area. <clears throat> Okay, solar drying of fruits and vegetables. This is another very popular uh, project there. Normally what people do, they throw the, the fruits and vegetables on the ground, you know, in the, and a week later they pick them up, and it's very dirty, of course, the bugs get in there and so forth. But now we have these uh, different types of solar dryers. There's a hole in the front and a hole in the back there, so you get airflow in there, so they get very quality products. And then um, the, women, the women can make some money this way, and also, they can sell it in the off-season, so then even get more money. So again, empowering women through business. And you know, they make different types of solar dryers. Uh, some, the, the one on the right-hand side has even a little chimney in there to get some more airflow uh, going in there. <clears throat> the other project that's been very successful is making of biomass briquettes. Okay, um, this is for, for fuel, actually. So what does normally happen in, uh, in Nepal is that after the agricultural season is over, they burn it on the field. Right? Now women actually collect that, as you can see over there. And then uh, I'll show you the process. Uh, then they, they chop up that biomass in small particles, in small parts, then soak it in water, okay, so that it becomes a heavy mush, and then press them in these, in these briquette presses press the, most of the water out of it, and then let them dry more into the sun. And then uh, you know, women become micro-entrepreneurs. They actually hire other women to collect that waste. And uh, <clears throat> so um, we actually, when I say we, the FOSS, the Foundation of Sustainable Technology, is one of my champions. Uh, you know, I started this project with him about eight or nine years ago. He got the BBC World Challenge Award, the second one, the second prize for social entrepreneurship. And um, so this is very, very uh, useful. <clears throat> then light is also such a basic need. You know, initially I thought, well, why light? Because then people will stay longer in their huts and they use more fuel. But there's a basic need there. So you know, we we'll put those into our programs too. So this is a friend of mine here. He makes he makes these. Um, I have a. He makes these LED lights here, the lamp here, and I have one sitting there on the table there. <clears throat> and try to make him more productive and, and sell them on the market. Um, so <clears throat> it eliminates the indoor air pollution of, uh, of a, a tricks or what are the tricks they use for, for, um, for lighting. And also some of these, these uh, lamps, they explode and so forth. At the same time, you can recharge these batteries. Now, there's different types of, uh, of uh, solar uh, lights. So this is the, the tuki, the solar tuki, they call it in Nepal. It has been very popular. They still make them. So um, here the, uh, the battery is inside this lamp. And uh, so it allows the, uh, the kids, if they're lucky enough, to have a, a school to do their homework, or the parents to do some uh, income generation things or, or, or other, uh, other productive things. <clears throat> and here you see uh, the, the lady of the house uh, putting the, uh, the, the, the solar tuki with the solar panel to the outside so the sun can charge up the battery. And then at night, uh, they have four hours of light with two of these, uh, two of these lights, with, with that one solar, uh, solar panel. Okay, so now, uh, how do you get people interested or aware of this technology? So we visit these, these various villages, okay, and then show all the different technologies I've been talking uh, with you about, and even more. We also do um, sanitation, so we have eco-toilets and um, uh, some other things, but uh, you know, we don't have enough time to talk about those things. 
But anyway, we, we show all these technologies, people taste the food and uh, see if they are interested in it. Then we, have the, we do interviews, so we actually talk to the, to the women, particularly in the villages, and see what are, what are your needs, what, how much uh, do you spend on fuel wood and so forth, and would you be interested in doing this, or, or participating in this. <clears throat> and then when there's interest, then you know, we have meetings, project meetings with the women's groups and the other leaders, and then of course we always need an, uh, um, an NGO in Nepal which you can trust and does the right, uh, does very good work and so forth, like the, uh, the for station of sustainable technologies and also engineers without borders we do stuff with and uh, the Basra Foundation. <coughs> and then um, you know, we, we have training workshops in a group, group session as well as on an individual basis. And uh, then at the end of the program, you know, it's very happy time when the distribution of these the various um, devices to the villagers. But you don't want to give things away for nothing. Okay, so we try to get either 5% to 20% of the cost depending. And okay, if you don't have the money, which quite often happens, that they can do some in-kind in work, like planting trees or do some other work in, in, in the area there, which would help this program, okay? So I always need to have something back. <clears throat> okay, with these projects, we are fighting poverty, okay? because everything is made locally in the country. We do not want to import any of these devices. They want it to be made locally. And if they can make some small businesses and make some money, then it becomes sustainable, and then you don't have to put money into these programs. So that's the ultimate goal. <clears throat> the other part is very important is also to follow up on these projects. So uh, I'm there every year. This year, not because of my, I messed up my knees with, with doing the projects here, but you know, to try to do that every year, and then also ask the NGO to um, to follow up and, and say, hey, do you have any problems? Why, why don't you use your solar cooker? Right, it's nice weather, but you don't use it. Why is that? Or okay, things of that nature. <coughs> so follow up, follow up is is very important. Uh, then in 2002, uh, uh, November. I decided to try um, Rotary uh, to see if you can get some of these Rotary projects in there uh, and, and see if you can multiply what, what I'm doing. And so I've been able to um, do 20 matching grants over these years uh, with, with my Rotary Club and uh, in particularly in the, about the areas around Nepal, about one and a half hours up till like seven hours away from, uh, from Kathmandu. And sometimes you don't reach there uh, the same day. <clears throat> so how does this work with these matching grant programs uh, with Rotary? Okay, I have my club, the Los Altos Rotary Club. So we put some money in there, $4,000 on this one here. But then I make the rounds and go to other clubs. I, I tell, okay, this is what the project we want to do. Are you willing to put some of your, your cash in there? And there's also some money uh, which gets returned from the Rotary Foundation, uh, uh, three after three years what you donated to the Rotary Foundation. This is getting a little complicated, but anyway. So if you get other clubs involved too, the $4,000 becomes a $26,000 project. And here we're helping 2,000 villagers plus disabled groups, it's about 500 or so. So here you talk about $10 per person with this simple technology because everything is made locally. Uh, not only the villagers, but this project also deals with the disabled. And here's a whole list of the, of the disabled people. And th there is this NGO, Shanta Seiwa NGO, which houses these uh, people who are disabled. They get them off the streets, also give, the, uh, give them some, some things to do, like artwork, which you see here, or other things, uh, also some, uh, some metal working, or uh, uh, carpentry working and stuff like that. And so this way people get their self-esteem back. They don't have to, to back on the streets. <clears throat> so this project was to teach the uh, disabled how to make these biomass briquettes. And uh, you, know, you, you cannot see it, but this lady with a very big head, you know, people would laugh at her and so forth. Now she's productive and does things, okay? So as a result of this, the, the cooking cost for this uh, NGO of 500 people or so forth went from $700 per month to zero because they're using these briquettes and also use these rocket stoves which are very efficient. 
Now we find out that these, these leverage press um, cannot be handled by the blind people and people in wheelchairs. So the Foundation of Sustainable Technologies came up with a screw press, as you can see there, and uh, that takes up less space. It's actually less expensive. So this is the, the new press we are using now in these, in these projects. Uh, the disabled and even some of the untouchables, they work in the uh, organic farm and their, uh, their luncheon and the meals are being done by the solar cookers when, when you work on air. And then they also use some big uh, solar dryers for the, for the uh, NGO themselves or sometimes selling them on the market. Now, because I feel strong about this whole thing, uh, we have been extending projects to the disabled with a cash project to, to these, these villages here. And, uh, you know, it, it takes your, you know, you get to tears when you, when you see how the people uh, uh, are there. You know, nobody takes care of them really. And um, so they don't have hope. These, these are really, they, these are the forgotten groups, if you will. So, um, so we are helping uh, three um, leprosariums where people have re uh, recuperated from, from leprosy. And here Sanukaji is, uh, is holding the, the, the workshop here on how to make these uh, uh, briquettes. And here you, you, you see this, this pair making these briquettes, but they don't have fingers, okay? But still they're very good enough to, to, to make these things. And then we have other groups. Uh, we deal with two with this program, is the mentally impaired. Uh, we have uh, uh, Down syndrome uh, groups, and uh, also the, you know, the, the poorest of the poor, you know, they don't have to have to back on the streets again. They, they have some honor there. And then this, this fellow is an amazing guy. He's, he's a blind guy. He's producing these things like you can't believe. <laughs> um, high volume stuff. And on the right hand side, you can see where they are being sold in, in even uh, in supermarkets now. And they, uh, this is the, these briquettes uh, cost a little bit more even. They can sell them more than, than, than wood, which is getting scarce in the, in the area. Now this is a very interesting new, new use for these briquettes for cremation. Okay, this, this, this is the holy temple, Pashupatina temple, which you know, tons of wood is being used there to, uh, to cremate them. And so um, some of these groups actually make these briquettes so there's less, less of that fuel would be used out there. So, uh, and also we find out that um, tea leaves, used tea leaves, gives the best uh, caloric value. So they go to, along the, the restaurants and pick up that stuff. Uh, so again, leprosy patients, they fight the stigma, making these briquettes. But the other thing we teach them too is take from um, plastic waste. You can make handbags and so forth, but just cut the strips and then weaving them into handbags or make uh, these, these very nice uh, placements. So this is a piece of art here. So they can actually sell this thing, these things as well. Um, now this is, let me talk about in Gatlang village, um, we did the project there, 27,000 project. Um, this is the area, you know, it took us 12 hours in a four wheel drive to barely get there in, in, in this village at 8,000 feet. But um, this was in the area, I was here uh, when, in my first time in Nepal, in this area. Nothing has changed, you know, everything basically the same, very, very backward and so forth. And this would be a beautiful area for, uh, for ecotourism, because look at this lady here. You keep on clicking pictures and stuff like that, you know, and, and how they are dressed and everything else. But you need to do things. So again, we have the same problems, and we're doing the, the same solutions here uh, to, uh, to empower the women. And in addition to, to that, we, I didn't talk about this, is also uh, teaching uh, health and sanitation and things of that nature, and good, uh, proper, proper food. Uh, the other part of the project was to install water pipes so the women and the girls again don't have to go up and down these, these mountains for carrying 70, 80 pounds of, of water in there. And then we repaired and did some installation of, of a few water taps. So if you want to have uh, tourists coming out there, you better replace those smoky fires with solar cookers and rocket stoves. I mean, I'm, when I'm out there, just uh, after five minutes you want to get out of there. Uh, I did some uh, s small uh, training workshops there to make some very simple solar cooker. 
and again to, to reduce the poverty, the extreme poverty in this village, you know, start tourist lodging, but the other part um, I'm very strong about is doing vocational skills, vocational training. So we are teaching them carpentry and metalworking. So 18 villagers, committed villagers, went to Kathmandu for a couple of weeks to learn how to make uh, solar cookers and solar dryers uh, and, and, and in general, um, you know, uh, woodwork. And here they show proudly their certificates. Another group of 18 went to Nepal, learned how to work with, with metal, welding, cutting, and folding, and all that. And here they proudly show uh, the, the rocket stoves there and the certificates as well, and the things they do. And then at the end of the project, okay, the devices are being distributed. This village, um, they were so poor they didn't have any money for it. So they uh, planted thousands of trees out there, okay? So we had some money left over to, in the project to do that. And so here, the rocket stove, the rocket stove rock, rotary rocks, they say, uh, heat retaining boxes, um, solar dryers in the, uh, carried in a standard basket and so forth. And a real success story that this villager from another project here started his own business fabricating these devices. Now in the Kathmandu um, Valley areas, okay, I also get involved with, with schools. So here we're kicking off a school program where we want to put solar and green technologies and sort of like STEM, you know, science, technology, engineering, and math into their curriculum a little bit. So we demonstrate at the schools, uh, and teach how to solar cook and pasteurize water, um, then at the same time you can get your mathematics and your physics in there. Uh, and here the, the students actually make these solar cookers and water heaters. And there's also other groups, we, we call the Rotaract groups. These are individuals, sort of 20 to 30 years old, uh, they just uh, went through their um, uh, university training and so forth, but they want to do good things in the world. So I do presentations to them and I challenge them to help solve the problems Nepal has, because Nepal has many, and it is the, really the youth, the, the new generation, uh, they have to do something. You know, we messed this up. This generation, the previous one, we messed it up. They, they are the ones who are stuck with it. So part of the things we did is, is making these, these cook kits there and then um, teaching them how to, how to work with it. Um, okay, um, since day one, uh, when I went to Nepal, I was really into uh, promoting the ecotourism to save the environment. So I promoted or told the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the lodge keepers, how about putting a sunroom in there? So you, in the daytime you get sunshine and in the evening you can open the door to the, to the rest of, the, of the, uh, the lodge and take care of the, the heating bill a little bit. Uh, solar water heaters on the right are now mainstream. They didn't used to be when I went there, but now they are there. Um, also, to, in these remote areas, I, um, I developed this uh, with my son, actually, together, uh, this, this portable um, parabolic cooker out there. This got an average base camp. Inik and I were there and set the thing up there. And uh, this is now being made in, in Nepal. And then on the bottom there, you see my, my tracker cooker, uh, as I showed you earlier, to, uh, to talk to the, so I can demonstrate very quickly. Uh, to, to get rice done in 30 minutes. And also, I interviewed the lodge keepers. How much food do you use for cooking? How much for water? How much for heating? And so forth. So get an idea what their, what their needs are. And at the same time, teach them how to, to, cook, them, uh, to cook them in, the, in another way, bigger way. And uh, I donated this, this that, uh, tracker's cooker to many climbers over the years. And I was the happiest guy in the world when Dava Steven Sherpa sent me a picture of him on the top of Mount Everest with my, uh, Everest with my little cooker out there to make a statement to the world that even you know, on the top, you actually cook faster in, on the top than, uh, than lower because there's no particles in the air. Um, okay, so in the uh, tourist areas you see many, many of these SK-14, the biggest uh, parabolic cookers. Um, I was in, the, in this uh, near the Tibetan border, and I saw the construction going on by the Basra Foundation of a new eco-resort where they use all renewable energy. So solar, hydro, biomass, uh, LED lights, and so forth. 
And fortunately, you cannot see this, but this is a um, Scheffler, a new Scheffler cooker uh, designed by Gada, uh, uh, Deepak Gadia, a good friend of mine from India. This thing is 43 square meter big, okay? And it is focusing its, its heat or the light onto this oil reservoir so that uh, you can actually cook with that even if you don't have sun, sunshine for a couple of days. Just amazing. Uh, okay, so this is Nepal. Um, I did also a project in Mongolia, uh, like in, in, in uh, 89, oh, no, 90, 96, 1996, for solar electric, but also uh, in the coldest capital in the world, I could cook my rice in any of these cookers here. And it's cold, because uh, it's minus, so, m minus 20 or something in the, uh, in the, in the winter, springtime. Uh, then Indonesia have done uh, a number of matching grant pro projects, also talked to uh, conferences and make presentations. Um, then in, the, uh, in another project in Indonesia ne next to the tsunami island there, we did a big project there. So solar cooking and also health and uh, income generation programs there. Uh, my club has a, has a number of projects going on with in Yucatan, Mexico. So here you can see Inik and I making some of these solar cookers, but this program is, is actually to, uh, um, to uh, build schools for the, for the Mayan kids and keep their, uh, um, their methods there. Uh, we were in Tibet um, at Everest Base Camp on the top left. We cooked, we cooked some tea there. And uh, solar cookers are almost mainstream uh, in, in Tibet, not quite, but you see a lot of them on the, uh, on the open streets. Uh, Peru workshop, we did at uh, Lake Titicaca. Uh, we did the Machu Picchu uh, trek, and uh, Ineke is, is having her uh, lunch there at the uh, power, uh, Temple of the Sun. Uh, Bolivia projects got involved with that. Uh, when I go to Chile, do some networking with NGOs. So whenever I have a chance, I always try to find NGOs who do the right things. But we should not forget the USA, okay? We should do all these things here. If we would do this, then the rest of the world would follow us, okay? So please, uh, you know, <laughs> cook, cook with the sun. Uh, so I do presentations to scouts, everybody who wants to listen to me, and thank you for inviting me here. Um, do demonstrations all over the place. Um, also Los Altos, they have an uh, uh, open house uh, of the city, of our art fair. So you see my granddaughter on the top making um, um, popcorn. Every five, six minutes, new popcorn pops up, okay? And then here we make the, the chocolate chip cookies. And in another one, we, we cook our regular meal for that day. And the next day, we do the same thing. So just get the people aware of it, and they cannot believe it. Um, okay, if you don't care about the environment and so forth, how about emergency preparedness, okay? Um, we don't have to worry about some of these things because we already cook with the sun and have can have safe water. But I tried to get this into the, uh, uh, you know, these uh, emergency response teams and so forth to, to get that technology in there. At least have one in your, in your house or in your, in your car or uh, use it with camping. Then I teach the young generation, you know, these are fourth graders in uh, um, East San Jose. They think they're they are poor. I, I let them know that, hey, you are not all that poor compared to these countries uh, where uh, I, I visit and do stuff. Um, then you have these high school, these interact clubs. They're a little bit associated with, with, with Rotary. They want to do, do good things in the world. Great, these are great kids. You know, um, two years ago, they collected $60,000 with fundraising for Cook Kids for Congo and, and for, for a Tibetan project. And currently, uh, they make these uh, Cook Kids uh, for Afghanistan. And they use peats uh, aluminum for the, uh, uh, instead of aluminum foil. So they get that from peats. <clears throat> And uh, well, these are some prayer flags waving in the wind. Hopefully, good things are going to happen in Nepal. And uh, namaste. Thank you for listening. Um, and this is my card here, and this is it. <laughs> so. <clears throat> okay, so if anybody has a question, go ahead and, and I. I will do as usual, try to take people who have never asked a question before. It's been a long time, but 
I'll try to do it as fairly as possible. Uh, excellent presentation. It was very informative. Uh, um, but my uh, question is, is that the, the, there's new solar panel technology being developed that's you know, lower cost and higher efficiency every year, and in new batteries that are going to be built, you know, in Elon Musk's new right. super gigafactory mm -hmm. that are going to be very low cost lithium ion batteries. And it makes me wonder what your feelings are, say, four years from now when the, the, the cost is lower, but it's, it's kind of high tech yet. Right. But it, it's, it, would you feel comfortable? You know, because they can't make this themselves in Nepal probably for a long time, providing them with you know electrical tech, more electrical technology, um, you know, as opposed to stuff that they make themselves. You know, and I, I, I can right. see an argument both ways. So I just wonder what your feelings were that way. Yeah. Well, we need to do a little bit of the, of the of the solar electric, right? I just showed you the, the panels over there, and there's a pen, little panel here. Now that that solar panel that's not being made in, in Nepal yet, but that's something we could possibly do. But think about this: um, you know, the efficiency of the solar panels now it's like 16 to 20 percent, and every year it gets a few percentages better. Okay, but if you look at thermal heating, that that efficiency is like 50, 60 percent. Okay, so you have that that difference out there. Okay, and then the cost factor and so forth. So, but as soon as it gets get, you know, um, uh, cost efficient, then that's something to, uh, to, uh, to, to do. But I don't think in four years the cost of these panels uh, for, the, for the individuals will be uh, low enough. Uh, but you know, if you have hospitals or uh, NGOs or, or big buildings, definitely, then the, the payback is, is right there. Does that answer your question a bit? Or, yeah. Um, maybe I don't know enough physics, but I was trying to figure out how you do not lose the heat in the sealed box, because doesn't the food absorb it? It starts out cold, and it would absorb the heat. In, in what box? You mean in that box? Yeah, in the sealed box. You said oh, the, the heat box, can't go anywhere. This one here. I assume that's right. what you were talking about. Well, yes. Well, this, this, yeah, this is the, this, the solar box, the yeah. typical solar box. So it is a, it's a... Um, Cardboard box inside another cardboard box, and the insulation is crumpled up newspaper, so it, it stays stays hot for for quite some time. Well, yeah, it doesn't last forever, though. I mean, no, not, not forever. Long enough to cook the rice. Oh yeah. Yeah. I mean, that, and yeah, and sure. the other question I wanted to ask yeah. you was about what about winter versus summers, particularly okay. if you have wind. Uh, does that, that is impact? Not yeah, that is not that much of a factor as what you would think. Because yeah. like, like I said, in Ulaanbaatar, the coldest capital in the world, mm -hmm. I cooked it, we used to cook it even there and so forth. Yeah. It has some effect, but this is pretty well insulated. Okay. Sometimes people uh, come up with two layers of, of glass, but that doesn't make that much difference. And that gives some other problems, more expensive, heavy, and so forth. Uh, so it is a little bit of an, an issue, but not, not a big one. Yeah. Now, if the wind is so far, so actually on, on this one here, if you have wind, what you need to do is you have to, um, in, in, instead of it blowing away, on the back side you, you put some stakes in there so that it, it doesn't flow, uh, you know, f float away. So there are things you can do with, with these very lightweight ones. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm impressed that the, you don't produce much smoke even in any of the things because uh, you know obviously about particulate matter and how once you inhale that you can't get oh, yeah. that out of your lungs. That's right. I sure. mean it's permanent lung damage. Yeah, it's a big problem. Right. Hi, Just this is a quick... very, very interesting, wonderful talk. Um, I'm curious, maybe you mentioned this, I was a couple minutes late, but I didn't hear you say anything about do these things ever get sold or traded among villagers and some people are better at making them than others and turn it more into a business? Because I know with the uh, one child per laptop thing that they started uh, selling them and became sort of an economic right. thing to own one of these things. Well, there's some, some of the people who got trained by, by our programs are actually in small business, not in a major way. Uh, also what we see is that we do a project in, in one village that the other villages around them want to participate in some of those too. So you have some of that stuff going on. And uh, you know, if, if I, you know, on these cook it's one, those are the simple ones. Everybody can make those. So I, you know, I, I try them to 
to be able to, to, to sell those in, into those villages as well. But um, even though I started this, and, and in Nepal they did not have solar cooking at all since uh, uh, when, when I went to Nepal in the, in '92. Uh, so we have, I've been working on that and just trying to get more and more people involved in it. So it is still, you know, uh, you know, percentage-wise small. Uh, in terms of people who have access to solar uh, cooking and, and so forth, uh, maybe maybe half a million or so, something like that. You know, so still, you know. And uh, one other problem is too that we are. You have this uh, organization, uh, Hillary Clinton is part of that, on, on these rocket stoves. They call them uh, um, smokeless stoves or something. And these are the rocket stoves. Well, they gave up a little bit of smoke. But they do not, that group doesn't want to listen to, to the solar, the solar community. Where I put some of these rocket stoves into our programs because it makes sense, but they don't want to do that. So that's the other part. Of, like politics get into the way here. So that's another thing. If you can get that, you know, the solar cookers back into that organization, then uh, a lot of good things uh, will be happening. So we are working on that with the Solar Cookers International organization. I'm a volunteer for them for the last 26 years in, in Sacramento. Oh, on, my, uh, on my trip to Turkey, I, I discovered an amazing situation. They do almost universally, if they have anything to do with the sun, it is for solar hot water heating. They don't. There are not so many uh, uh, solar panels for electricity or anything like that. They almost exclusively hot water heating, and that yeah. saves a lot on. Uh, natural gas and that sort of thing. Oh yeah, but that's actually in, in Nepal already too. Uh, that was the first popular uh, way to use solar is, is basically water, the, the water heaters. Now they are uh, relatively expensive still for say a lodge in a remote area. So what I tell them, okay, you can have one of these solar cookers here, and you can boil your water there and, and dilute it with water so that, and make it for showers so that the tourists can do the bucket shower thing, okay? And so with, with low money, they can do it, because so that way they can compete with the lodge keepers who have these, these, these solar water panels. But yeah. <clears throat> yes. Oh, hi. I missed the first part of your presentation, but I think I see a, a cardboard aluminum uh, at the maybe this one? The, ver the very cheapest model. Oh yeah, yeah. Right, yeah, right. I have I have one of those. Okay, good. And the and and it it cooks rice, uh, but it does take a while. And the problem I have with it, yeah. uh, using it, is that I need to go out and turn it when the sun moves, mm, and and I need to have it in a black pot. Right. But it does work just fine for cooking, like rice especially is the best. I haven't tried any complicated cooking well, with it. Okay. And it only cost thirty dollars at the right. common ground yeah. they had it. And I got I got a couple here too if people are interested. Uh -huh. But I, I'm sort of surprised that, that you are not that happy with it because we do lasagnas in there. Chicken Really? Mm -hmm. Chicken is the best chicken you ever have because it's a slow cooker. But that, that's not for the whole day. That's like two hours, three hours because yeah. it's just a single pot. And one, one thing I do also, and you might do that too, on the bottom, I, I, I have a, a, a wooden disc, okay? Or you can, you can do, use uh, maybe chopsticks. Three for chopsticks insulation? For actually, so that the, yeah, so that the pot doesn't hit the, 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 uh, the high temperature plastic. Okay. And there's also airflow underneath it, so it's a little bit more efficient. Okay. Um, and, and the bags last longer. Okay. But like I say, you know, chicken or, or basically everything except stir fry, you can do with this thing. Uh -huh. And this is almost as quickly as the box cooker because it's only a single cooker. Oh, yeah. And in terms of, of focusing, this is not like a, like a lens like this one here. So in this one you have to maybe refocus every half hour or something like that. But it's so fast it's not a problem because you're already done. Yeah. But with these things, you know, even if this, the sun is not exactly there, it picks up the, uh, the, the sunlight from, from the side panels and so forth. So um, what, what we usually do, say we're not, not at home, 
we put the box cooker or, or that cooker there, we put it where the sun will be maybe like at one o'clock. So then a few hours before one o'clock and a few hours after one o'clock, it, it, that's the cooking. Yeah. And if you have the box cooker, then it's insulated so it stays warmer. With the plastic bag, you know, it will, will lose its, uh, its heat. Uh, but it does well. make lovely rice, very fluffy. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. good. <laughs> Uh, thank you. Yeah, this all sounds wonderful to me. Um, and I, so I was just wondering if someone wanted to make a donation of money to help support your efforts, what would be the best ways to do that? Okay. Um, thank you for offering that. Well, there's a couple of things. Uh, you can either uh, donate money to uh, Solar Cookers International. I'm a volunteer for them too. I'm, a, you know, I'm an advisor on that and so forth. They're in Sacramento. It's a great organization. Go to solarcooking.org and or pick up my card. So that's one way to do it. Uh, we, we just got a four day, or, or three day convention, solar convention in Sacramento. With, with country like 20 different countries all over the world getting together, discussing things. The other way to uh, give money is to, like our Rotary Club, we have a foundation. So then it is, uh, you know, uh, you can uh, take your uh, tax advantage of that one. And then with, with, on your check, you, you say, well, this is, should be like a solar program in where, wherever uh, uh, we, we do stuff. So that's another way. Um, you know, you can give money to me, but you cannot, you know, so uh, don't do that. Just, just get your tax advantages. And uh, um, yeah, those are the two possibilities. And well, just a reminder as well, if it's okay with you, I'll take your slides and we'll post those on the web so right. people can get access to your contact information That's there right. if they need to follow up. Yeah. Um, my question was, I was assuming that if you wanted reliable cooking, you would need at least a solar cooker and then when you had several days of rain or cloud, you'd, you'd, you'd need a rocket type right. cooker too. But then you mentioned, and I didn't catch how, that some, somebody designed something that stored the heat for two or three days. Um, what, could, I missed how they did that. Could well, you just explain that again? That was one of these uh, gigantic, this is the uh, Scheffler cooker, uh, the, the big, big uh, reflector cookers, right? And the one I mentioned is, is 43 uh, square meter, okay? But they also, you can do it with, with a little bit smaller one. So basically, you know, so the focal point is outside, so there's a, there's a big uh, oil uh, container there, which gets heated up at very high temperature. And then, so it stays warm for quite some time, so the next day and maybe another day. They are just in implementing this for right now, so I don't know the exact uh, uh, statistics on it. But uh, I would think for at least like two days or so, you could do it. And I think they can even insulate that thing as well. Um, and even with the, uh, with the smaller, the nine square meter, um, you, can, you can cook even when the sun is down for a little bit because they use a big, uh, big plate there where the cooking pots are on there. So that big plate stays hot for, for some time as well. But, but the key is basically they have this, this technology, where phase change technology, where, um, and, and that is still being uh, explored. So theoretically, you could uh, change the phase when the sun is out there, and when, the, when there's no sun, down, you use the energy uh, to, to cook. Uh, but the, this phase change materials is, is toxic, and there are some other problems with. So, um, but uh, there's a number of uh, uh, universities are working on that, and actually, the Gates Foundation got gave some money to, uh, I think, Irvine or something. Was that the Irvine one? To, to one university there to look into this, this phase change because that's the, you know, if you can have that, then you are not uh, dependent on, on the sunshine. For, for, for chemi from chemical, chemical, uh, chemical things. So, yeah. <clears throat> Yes. Hi. Maybe I missed it earlier, but uh, could you elaborate more on these briquettes? Is that a okay. bi biomass product or human waste, or what? What is that? No, it's not human waste. They already do this. You know, they, they put these things on the on the south side of their of their heads. No, this is uh, agricultural waste, uh, or tea, or used tea leaves, or anything which is biomass. All right. So just to prevent them burning it on the field, uh, you know, they, they collect that and then chop it up in small parts. And, uh, and, and make these briquettes out of it. But I, I have different versions of... Uh, actually, they make them bigger now, too, than this. But, and also can make them in, in this shape, so it looks like, like wood, in a way. <laughs> um, 
But here, uh, Sandro Kaji he, he, he gave me this one. So some are made only of sawdust, wall plants, dupi, tea, uh, banana, leaves, uh, carton box, uh, but any, any biomass will work. Yeah, so you just mix it all together and dry it out and that's there right. It is. Yeah, okay. That's right. Yeah, yeah. And, and the last question is your parabolic uh, heater there. Just the, yeah. the nature of that, you right. get a focus point, and that's right. why you can start a fire. Right. But now, if you're trying to cook something, how do you get an even enough distribution to not burn something in one little spot? as opposed to heating a pot of rice. Yeah, because this is not, this is not the perfect parabolic, because you don't want that, because you don't want to drill, drill holes into, <laughs> into your pot. Uh, the other part is, too, that so the focal area is around, around this, this area here, so you never have to worry about burning pot. You know, only when I put a piece of paper in there, it will burn, but otherwise, it's, you know, it, you, that's not the problem. The other part is, too, that I don't like the, the, the parabolic cookers where the focal point is outside except those Scheffler cookers, but that's for, for, for bigger uh, uh, organizations. Because, you know, if, if the focal point would, would be outside, you know, you could, you could burn your house, or if there's a dog by, uh, coming by there, you have a hot dog, right? So, <laughs> so therefore, it's better to have the focal point inside. Uh, yeah, don't, don't have the problem, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, yes. Yes. Following up on the uh, briquettes, Yes. I saw something about 50 years ago in China that follows this, but eliminates the distribution of the briquettes and such. And what happens is this guy on a bicycle had a little cast iron uh, mold, I suppose, and he would go to the individual homes or places where you would gather your waste, you would sun dry it so there was no gathering of it. He would come by periodically, sit down there, and he would put the stuff in there and whack it with a big hammer yeah. and then leave it there and right. then go on to the next one. Okay. So he's extremely efficient. <laughs> the second one that I wanted to mention, and you're probably familiar with this since it's a Harvard University thing, the problem as you've mentioned with all of these, you want to have it produced locally, is that they don't have very high skill technology, right. uh, like a machine shop, a welding, metal mm -hmm. fabrication, stuff right. like that. So what this program did was find someone, probably in the capital, the bigger city, they, they always have at least one machine shop, something like that, right. oh, yeah. contract with them and said, look, we have developed this new product here and we would like to have you have exclusive contract to do this, right. but we're going to fix the price. You cannot offer more than this. It's just a very sustainable amount, so this is very base. You're not going to get rich out of that, right. but you can produce it locally, can it get done, and uh, you'll have 100% of the volume that's there. And secondarily, the other problem, our people don't have monies. They don't have banks. They don't have savings. So you need to allow them, say, one year or four equal right. payments that with no interest so you need to produce it and finance it. And now you can step up to a higher level of sophistication right. because you're not requiring yeah. on a home skill crafts. Well, but we have these workshops, like the, the Foundation of Sustainable Technology, for instance, we work with them a lot. So he works with some workshops which, which have those tools and they're very creative themselves. So there's a good back and forth there to, to make these things better. So, yeah, some of that is happening. Yep. Thanks for your info. So I think this might be our last question. Lunch is almost ready, so. I'm wondering how you put these briquettes in this bottle. That sounds more complicated than to put a ship, assemble a ship inside a bottle. I put it there because I wanted you to ask me that question. <laughs> because there's always that question, okay? And, um, well, it took me a long time to do this, right? <laughs> Magic, like this. <laughs> but if you look at this, you might see this cut here, okay? <laughs> so it's cheating, that's true. But other than that, it's magic, it works. <laughs> uh, we might have time for one more really quick question. All right, I saw one hand. I just read something the other day that perhaps you could verify. Okay. Is that if we could capture all of the energy from the sun oh. on the earth, for one hour, oh, yeah. that would allow enough energy 
for all the world's needs for one whole year. Yeah. I have trouble with that figure. Have yeah. you any idea? No, I think that's probably true. Somewhere around there. I mean, it's gigantic numbers. Um, but you know how much we're using here, and you can sort of figure out how much uh, kilowatts we're using or megawatts we're using in this country, and then figure out, you know, this, this is sun coming in there. It's like one kilowatt per square meter or something. So you can figure that out. But yeah, I believe that's true. And by the way, uh, I have some more information here if you want to look at things, or if you want more information, put your name down there, and uh, uh, I can help you out later on. Okay, so. one last quick comment. We're using 15 terawatts uh, currently on Earth, and the sun, I believe, is a kilowatt per meter squared. Right. So you can do that calculation pretty easily. Yeah. I haven't done it yet in my head, but. Yeah. <laughs>